All right, Melina, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. We started talking about your Native American Indian background. Um, and you live, you, so you said in the opening that you work for A&M, you do that online. You're up in Washington state. Yes. And originally from Alaska. So like an international <laughs> yep. person. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yep. All over for, for that. And, uh, Yep. I lived in three states, uh, bef- but I went to the same school from like kindergarten uh-huh. through all of elementary and whatever, never. So we moved from Alaska to California to Washington before I started kindergarten. Oh, it was all when you were young. Yeah. And I think um, Gleb Sapursky yeah. connected us, right? Yeah, yeah. Now, how okay. did you get in touch with Gleb? He's in like Columbus or Cleveland or something, right? Yes, he is. And I have a contingent of folks that I have gotten together with, I guess, in that area, which I would say the original hub for that would be Brian Ahern. Oh Um, yeah. I know. That's how I met Gleb. Right. And so Brian introduced me to Gleb and to Kwame Christian, who's one of just my absolute favorite people, um, and a few others there. Uh, so just great, great people there in Columbus. I was supposed to be speaking at Ohio state in March of 2020 in person. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, (laughs) so that didn't happen, but I was supposed to be going, I was going to go, you know, meet and have coffee with Brian and all that. So that we have a big pin in that, that when, whenever I next make it to Columbus or you'll meet everybody. Yeah. I actually lived in Columbus for two years. I lived there from sometime in 96 to sometime in 98. Nice. So, yeah. So we were, that was like 20 years ago before I even got married. And then we went back and our house looked like it hadn't even been touched in 20 years. It looked the same. It was weird. <laughs> but I also met Frank. Um, you know, Frank Agin? I think he introduced me to Brian. I think that's how that came about. Yeah. No, I don't, uh, I don't think I know him. It's like the Kevin anyway. Bacon game with this. But if he knows uh, Brian, you know, could happen. Yeah. Brian's, <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, I think, I think when it comes to like six degrees of separation, it's very, the circles start overlapping very, very quickly, you know? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So I appreciate coming on and we started talking about the things that you do and maybe we can go back as you were saying about your background and where you grew up and how you kind of got into all the work that you're doing now. It didn't just happen overnight. So maybe you want to take me through that a little bit. Yeah, sure. So my undergrad is in business administration with a focus uh, in marketing. And while I was in school, um, you know, I actually debated, I kind of looked at this pre-med and was considering going into psychology, psychiatry for a while, uh, but settled in business. And I remember there was one class that had just like one book, one section, just this tiny little tidbit about buying psychology and why people do the things they do. And I just thought this is the coolest thing I've ever heard. This is amazing. And decided I wanted to go back and get a master's in that when I was going to go back to school. And I spent the better part of 10 years calling universities and seeing what options they had. And everybody said, that's not a thing. <laughs> you can't do that. <laughs> uh, well, actually what they said was, uh, if you want to create your own program, you can do that here with us to which, you know, if I know yeah. what I need to study, I don't need to pay you. Right. Exactly. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I was working in industry, running a marketing department for a financial institution in Seattle, really loving the work I was doing and was in this innovation fellowship of sorts, this two year okay. program. And for one of these, they brought in some guest speakers from the Center for Advanced Hindsight at Duke University, which wow. is their behavioral economics wing uh, under Dan Ariely, who is one of the, the biggest names in, in behavioral science. If you okay. this know was while, this was like a, an internship program in the company you were working in. It, it was actually, it's through, it was a credit union program. It's through the Filing Research Institute, which I would expect no one's really familiar with (laughs) that's listening. So, um, yeah, but they have hundreds of applicants from people across North America and they invite about a dozen to be part of these two year programs where you're working on innovation. And we presented at Harvard and the world credit union conference, really cool stuff. Um, and so so, yeah, they, they brought in those people from, from Duke to talk about what they were working on. And I saw their research and thought, Oh, this is the thing I've been looking for for right. 10 years. And they told me it was called behavioral economics. And I said, 
okay. You know, as a marketer, I went eh, <laughs> economics. Okay. Yeah. We'll see. <laughs> yeah, econ I was uh, an economics major. That was the thing in college. They told you doesn't apply to the real world. And you're like, well, then why am I learning this? <laughs> well, good you news. Know? It does <laughs> very uh, it much. It does. So. Yeah. That is the good news. I found that out later on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. So I, um, jumped in, found myself a master's program in behavioral economics. Uh -huh. And here we, are. here we are. And I found very quickly, uh, because it is a newer field, it's based on decades of very valid scientific research. But as it's kind of coming together over the years of, you know, economics and psychology and neuroscience, it's this kind of really great melting pot of people coming together to realize what's really happening in the brain and how we actually make decisions. Yeah. This was a very academic field. It still is, but it's making some changes now. But when I started my master's for sure, and all these things that were so clear to me about how to apply the information to business communication and to brand strategy and right. pricing strategy and helping people achieve their goals just wasn't anywhere. There wasn't anybody talking about it or doing anything with it. And so started my podcast and, uh, all kind of went along, uh, from there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I say, th I think, and I find this consistently cause I've been doing the podcast long too, and I've interviewed a lot of different people and it seems that business owners, especially small business owners, entrepreneurs, right? They, they always think that they know like what drives their client base and what drives their customers and how they make decisions and what they're interested in. And nine times out of 10, they're wrong, mm. you know, and it wouldn't take a lot to ask, to just ask on a consistent basis and to learn those types of things. And I think that, I mean, I guess it, it sounds like something that should be a big field, but I guess it's, I guess it's, it's on not. its way. It's happening. Yeah. Well, but well, the thing is with behavioral economics and behavioral sciences is realizing that there's actually so much more happening in the brain than we realize. And when we talk about conscious versus subconscious, you know, we know, we know there's stuff happening behind the scenes. We've heard our, our brains being compared to an iceberg, you know, before, of course. but you don't really like to think about how much is happening in that subconscious level, especially for yourself, right? You assume you're making logical choices in everything that you do, but Nah, you know, we're human. That's not really the world we live in. And studies are showing, you know, as much as 99% and beyond is done in that subconscious processing space. Right. Of course. And, well, cause we couldn't focus, we uh, not focus. We couldn't function as right. human beings. You can't literally stop and think, and what am I going to do next? That's like, <laughs> do you stop and think about breathing or pumping your heart? I'm, you know, yeah. How to take a step or <laughs> yeah, you just do it. And that's yes. true. Yeah. Yeah, but actually it goes beyond that into the decision-making process. So the average person makes 35,000 decisions every single day. Okay. And- Surprise, it's that well, low. <laughs> I, I would think right. it'd be more. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you don't consciously think through them. You can't. But you have to be making them. And that's even, you know, which hand you use when you're brushing your teeth and right. how you uh, put, if you put the milk in first before coffee or, you know, these little tiny things that seem silly, but goes into bigger decisions too, when we're going through the grocery store or what toothpaste we're going to buy or how we respond to an ad, if we're going to click, if we feel interested in that email that we just saw, all these things really are done using these heuristics, these rules of thumb by the subconscious brain mm -hmm. to um, based on what has worked well in the past and what behavioral economics does is allows us to understand a, a good amount of those rules that the mm -hmm. brain is using. And so what I do is then help people in business to be able to make a slight tweak to their communication. You know, if your headline is worded in a slightly different way, or your image is a little bit different, uh, these little tweaks that you can do that can end up having a really big impact without having to spend a lot of money and looking at small business and entrepreneurs to me, you know, the big companies are investing in behavioral science, behavioral sure. economics. They're having chief behavioral officers. Now, uh, people working with large organizations that are uh, focused on behavioral sciences to be able to incorporate this into 
those big companies, you know, Walmart, Netflix, right. Zillow, on and on and on. Amazon. Yes. Uh, and so for me, small business and entrepreneurs have always been very important to me, close to my heart. And so I feel that if there isn't someone who is intentionally helping them to know these things and have right. some tips for how to implement them, they're going to go away. They're because at they disadvantage. Yeah. And I'm not okay with that. Right. So, um, yeah. That's so there's a lot of it, like kind of subliminal advertising, like the kind of thing you think about growing up, like that the, that the, the liquor companies and the cig <laughs> cigarette companies would do, you know, we all learned about like the camel, and we learned about like things in like the ice and a glass and an ad. I mean, is that what a lot of this stuff is about or not really? It's, it's not as in the way that people like define that it's not, if that is helpful, I guess, in a way that doesn't feel gross to you to think about yeah, how this can work, right? you know, that's okay. Uh, right. But essentially, so an example, you know, one of my favorites being, uh, so there was a study that was done with grocery store end cap displays okay. yeah. and one is labeled as Snickers bars, buy them for your freezer. The okay. other says Snickers bars buy 18 for your freezer of which most of us would say 18 is a lot of Snickers bars, probably more than we're buying on a regular basis. Yeah. And if you were the one creating that message, you may feel a little apprehensive about putting a number like that on the ad, you know, to say, someone's going to ask me where I came up with this. I don't want to have to justify an arbitrary number. And you know, them is unlimited and people could get a hundred if they wanted, blah, blah, right. blah, your logical brain trying to tell you why you want to do that. And you may think it doesn't make that big of a difference. But what this study found was there was a 38% increase in sales when you had the number 18 instead of the word them. And it's not anything special about 18 specifically. It is the concept behind it, which is called anchoring and adjustment. And so with the word them, if your subconscious even cares enough to flag your conscious brain as something, when you see that ad, you know, maybe you get two Snickers bars, right? Three, right. Whereas when it's 18, the brain potentially doesn't have a rule for that and is thinking, mm, that's weird. <laughs> you know, what do we right. do about this? And probably also would say, you know, 18, I'm way better than everybody else. I don't need 18. I'll just get six. Right. Which will be more than you would have gotten before. It's like I gave you permission to get more. Like who wants to walk up to the counter with 18 Snicker bars, Snickers bars, people are like what? Looking at you. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Yeah. It's interesting. Uh, you know, just say it's for the lacrosse team or whatever. Right. right? Exactly. When you're picking them up. The other concept that's kind of behind the scenes there is one that we uh, call framing, which is okay. how you say something matters much more than what it is specifically that you are saying. Okay. In the case of those slight tweaks from them to 18 the question that's being asked of the brain is slightly different as well. Whereas when you have them, the question right. is, do you want Snickers? Right. When it's 18, it's more of this implied sale, you know, assuming that it's going to happen. Your question is how many do you want to buy? Right, right. It's a very, very small shift, but it has a lot of impact on the brain when you're looking at buying things. Yeah, well, it's, you know, it's common in the sales business, they tell you to, you don't give somebody a choice between doing and not doing, right, you give them a choice between a large and a small or, you know, something like that, because that's the way our brains work, right? We, right. we don't say no, we, we, I don't know, we're presented with two options. And you're like, okay, well, I'll take this one, you know, type of a thing. And I yeah. think that it's a lot of it's not manipulative, but it's definitely psychological. It's just understanding. Work. And really for me, um, the, because you, you said the word manipulative, I feel like we should at least talk ethics for yeah. a moment. I get asked this all the time. I'm sure in the case of behavioral economics, we talk about and work in something called nudges that okay. we are helping to encourage a best decision, yeah. but there's always free choice involved. So right. if you were to say you must take candy bars or something, you're right. forced to have them. If you come in, you know, that's a little bit different and it's outside of the realm of what it is that we do. 
Right. In the case of behavioral economics, it's how you present information to help someone make what is the best choice for them. And really looking at for small business entrepreneurs, any business is really, you end up putting way too much information on stuff and it becomes right. very overwhelming for the brain. So it's yeah. difficult for someone to make a choice on something potentially they really would want. Right. And you're only, you love what you do. You created it for a reason and you know that there's a really great market for who should be buying that. And if you could make it easier for them to find you, why would you not really? Yeah. The other piece to this is of nudging is what we call choice architecture and this, how you present an option makes it more likely someone's going to make a choice or not. And you don't get to opt out of that. So whether you think about it or not, the way right. that you are presenting information is influencing the decision that someone is going to make. Uh -huh. So why not think about it first? Yeah, no, it makes sense. It makes sense. And I think a lot of people think like, when they're trying to sell their products or market their products that, you know, oh, I don't sell, you know, it's like a, this slimy, but, you know, really good people that teach you how to sell or market their products are just trying to get you to do something that is good for you. And you do want to do, you just need some help in making the decision as to which way you want to go. But what you're talking about there, though, it's kind of like menu paralysis, you know, like you go into a, a restaurant and you're ordering at the counter and there's tons of stuff. Mm -hmm. up on the board and some people just freak out they just can't make any because they they have this fear like well if i choose this then i won't choose this and that might be the better one than this one and you know their brain goes on uh, like short circuits right the so nudges is an acronym of which um understanding mapping is kind of how you go through that journey, but structuring yeah. complex choices is a big piece of this. You, we can't, like we've already said, our brains have so much, so many decisions we would need to make to even be able to survive. And we can't take it all on in our conscious brains because we would die. We can't consume enough calories for our brains to run in that way. And so we need to be able to make decisions quickly and easily. And if you are creating, if you were to just put all, imagine going to a restaurant and everything is just in alphabetical order. Right. Instead of in categories, like the salads and the sandwiches <laughs> and the entrees. Yeah. I know you'd go nuts. Yeah. It makes no sense. It would be awful. Your brain wouldn't know what to but do with the information, many, right? How many, or, you know, it's in, in, in uh, price order, everything is all jumbled together, uh, or some random person's favorite offering that makes no sense to somebody else without categories. But if you think about your own business, how often do you just put things in an order that makes no sense or that only makes sense to you because you have all this background information right. that the person who's going to buy from you the first time doesn't even know what to ask or what you're talking about. They might be leaving because it's confusing, not because it's not something they want or need. Right. I guess that also spills over into like merchandising, right? And retailing is how you set things up. People walk into the store, they feel like, what the hell? And then they leave. Yeah. Because it's just overwhelming to us. It's funny how we are uh, affected that way, like the way our brains work, because, you know, I mean, you're right. We couldn't, I think I saw something like we, we get like, I don't know, 22 billion bits of data that pass our eyes, like on a daily basis. If you tell me it's mm -hmm. 35,000, decisions and it definitely has to be like 22 billion and it's just so much information that you don't even see most of it it could make enter your brain but you don't see it consciously make a decision you wouldn't be able to function right the um so your subconscious where we're talking about like that in that 99 percent you know it's been said it can do 11 million bits of information per second if you right. were to think about <clears throat> your brain like a computer and your conscious brain can handle about 40 compared to 11 million. Yeah. Yikes. Yeah. <laughs> so you can't stop and think about everything. It's impossible. Yeah. I mean, a, a great example for everybody that's saying, well, sure for other people, but for me, I don't do that. Right. Yeah. I make the so, 11 million decisions. Yeah. <laughs> right. Our brains are wired to think we're better, faster, smarter than everybody else, including the us from five minutes ago. Right. right. We, yeah. Advanced now. Oh, now <laughs> they just learned something. Yeah. yeah. But if you think about yourself uh, driving a car, uh -huh. When you first learned to drive a car, it was really tedious and difficult. And you're yeah. trying to think about where your hands go and where you're supposed to be looking, which foot, foot is doing what. I mean, it's just so much and feels kind of agonizing. Yeah. 
especially if you were learning on a stick shift. <laughs> yeah, which and I did. So, <laughs> yeah. so the last time you drove your car, you probably didn't have to think about any of that stuff. You just sort of go through the motions. Riding so a say. bike. Right? You've all had that experience of getting home after a long day of work and you go, man, I don't even remember that entire drive. Yeah. The brain is still making all of those decisions, but it's done them enough that it's turned them into a habit. So sure. if you ever then drive maybe a significant other's car. If you were traveling, I know for me, when I would drive my husband's car, uh, it has, my car has the step e-brake and his is like the pull-up emergency. Oh, the handle in the middle. Yeah. Yeah. And I would Our do this like step like that, to yeah. nowhere every single time. Yeah, I would you, drive move, you put your foot down and boom. <laughs> right. And there's nothing there and yeah. feel ridiculous. And even where I'd say, I talk about this constantly. Don't do that. And I would still do it because it's a habit for my brain. Well, you ever and been so, driving somewhere, but you're going somewhere else, but it's kind of halfway to some other place you're used to going all the time. And you're thinking about something else and you end up in front of the building. You're like, what the heck am I doing here? <laughs> right. Or you miss your exit or whatever it is. So you can be on kind of this autopilot. If you want to say that's your subconscious, right. just kind of running the show. Cause you don't need to focus on it until maybe it's uh pouring rain and you're driving over a mountain overpass and you're between a semi truck and a guardrail, yeah, then you're paying real close attention and you can feel everything sort of ooh, right. <laughs> slow down. Yeah. This is all we need to focus on. And then you can feel every little like vibration of the wheel in your hands. And you're just so tense and focused because your conscious brain is now taking over that process that you don't even really have to think about all the time. And so that is just one example of how our brains are doing this really all day long in every yeah. All right. So, and I know I'm jumping around a little bit, but so, so I'm a small business owner, right? So how does all of this stuff we're talking about, right? We just overwhelmed everybody. They're like, what? <laughs> um, how do I incorporate that? How does it help me as a business owner now that I'm conscious of this stuff to yeah. run my business, make marketing decisions, so forth? Well, really, this is why I wrote my book, which is the, you know, what your customer wants and can't tell you. And it is uh, an applied guide for how to start using behavioral economics in your business. So it starts off, you know, just a little bit about the brain, some of what I've already talked about, but a little bit more to help you understand that. I've picked out 16 top concepts for businesses. Mm -hmm. Some we've already talked about. We talked about framing and anchoring. Those are in the book and it has right. you know, information about studies and things. And then little like apply it sections at the end of each chapter. And the book is kind of set up like a reference guide or a choose your own adventure. If you remember those books. Yeah. Like a primer type guide. of thing. Like you don't have to read the whole book. Right. Yeah. Um, but I have had plenty of people say that like they were going to just skim through before maybe doing an interview like this. And so they set aside an hour or something and just couldn't stop because it was so it reads like a story. It's intended to be fun versus a lecture of textbook of nightmares. So promise. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I, it is set up. So then you can learn about framing and a little bit about how it works and how you might use it and go through each of those concepts. And then part three is sort of combining them to, if you were working on your pricing strategy or thinking about menus of which just, even if you're not a restaurant, you do right. have a menu of options you're providing to people all the time and how to think about setting up tests and things like that are all in part three of the book. And then it goes into you know, don't get stuck, like you're saying, because we're overwhelmed <laughs> where you go, oh my gosh, that's so much stuff. Where do I start? Right. So it has a couple of little uh, hacks and brain tips for things that your brain might set to keep you in that status quo so that you you don't. So while perhaps it's not fair to say you should read my book, but uh, as far as- Well, we're going to put a link in the show notes to it so people <laughs> should read the book. Yeah. So with applying it and I do have, because I just can't help myself. There's an extra, you know, companion workbook that goes with it. That's free. It's 111 pages of extra worksheets that I just want people to be able to apply it. Like I said, especially right. in small business so that you can just go try some things in a way that is safe and feels responsible for you. So going and testing something like framing, you can just change subject lines on your emails or right. the color of a button somewhere or 
whatever that is, but you understand what behavior you're trying to change and therefore which concept is going to feels like it should work. And then you do a couple of tests. So is that what kind of like AB testing on emails falls into it? That's a type of framing. Uh, so AB testing is, um, just a, a form of testing to use, but if, if you were going to test how framing a message differently may work where you have what you've always been sending right. and then you change it to a slightly different frame, then you could see if it would be more impactful via something like AB testing. Um, and even big companies, Netflix, Google, they use AB testing all the time. So it's not like a rudimentary testing system that no one uses that you're adopting. Right. Um, so one example, just because I know I mentioned framing when I talked about the Snickers piece, yeah. but another grocery example for framing, because <laughs> uh, there are so many good ones there in the grocery store. I'm sure people are going to go to the grocery store after they hear this, if you're looking around and be like, you should, oh, well, that's what that's I, you what know, M Melina said. <laughs> Yeah, I know. I definitely talk about being a curious questioner um, and just looking around and asking, why did I click on that? Why did I right. look at this box instead right. of that one? Why does that sign say what it is, right? Right. So yeah. questioning and saying, do you think they did that on purpose? How, why would they have done that? What are they encouraging me to do? You know, th that sort of thing is, is valuable. But so if you were to go to the store today, say you need some uh, ground beef, you're making spaghetti tonight or something. And you get there and there are two stacks that are essentially identical. One is labeled as 90% fat free and the okay. other is 10% fat. Which one sounds more appealing and do you feel drawn to buy? If Am you I supposed are like, to answer that? Go ahead. It, yeah. 90%. They're the same, right. but who wants something that seems like it has a lot of fat in it? Right. And 10% fat, you're going, Ooh, I haven't been to the gym That's in like 18 lot. months. Where's yeah. that going to go? That sounds terrible. Whereas 90% fat free is such a great decision for me and my family. I'm being so responsible. Yeah. Like you said it's the same product. Right. Exactly. <laughs> but our brain just hears it differently. And whether you want to or not, you're going to feel drawn to buy one over the other. And that is a framing piece. So right. if you look at your own messaging and say, you know, what's my 10% fat message that I'm putting out there into the world and how might I reframe this a little yeah. bit differently uh, to be a 90% fat free message, even better or bigger than that, look across your industry. Where is everyone else talking in 10% fat that you can be the 90% fat free message. It'll That's help you advice. stand out yeah. against everybody else. Even if you're basically saying the same thing, but people will be more motivated to buy from you. Kind of like milk, right? Mm -hmm. Like whole milk is only 3%. I know. But I don't they don't know why. say that. They say 2%, 1% <laughs> fat free and whole milk. Yeah. I'm not sure why I feel like that's doing whole milk, a real disservice, but perhaps 2% yeah. is something they really want to sell. That's uh, <laughs> You're you know, right. getting into relative. Cause you don't want to show that the whole milk is basically the same as the 2% and people be like, well, right. Why do I need yeah. that one? That's so yeah. Relativity. You don't know that you're the behavioral econ economist. You should know all this stuff. Well, yes, I don't know specifically <laughs> on milk, but, um, when you look at, you know, go to the, the movies, and there's the popcorn, you know, when they are encouraging you to get the large jumbo yeah. bucket, you know, maybe the, the medium popcorn is seven fifty, and the huge one with a free refill is eight twenty five. you go, well, might as well get right. this one, right? If you were recommending or the best offer for you that you're wanting for people that you're selling to is something in the middle, then you would want to use those numbers a little bit differently to showcase the value of the medium. Right. Based on like maybe the big's much more expensive and they're like, Oh, the medium's the value. Cause I guess right. it really so depends medium's on your closer profit. to this, that small pricing. Right. Uh, yes. You know, you had a question. Wait, let me look. Where's your bio? You had, Oh, you help businesses a lot with pricing. You said, does it really matter? If prices end in a five, I didn't know I did what this means in a five, seven, nine, or zero. So that means like it's not ten dollars, it's nine ninety nine, or it's forty nine ninety five. All right, good. Right. I want to learn all this stuff because <laughs> okay. I'm always arguing with even customers, like not customers, other attorneys. Like 
should our should we be charging a thousand dollars for a will or 999 you know like i want to hear about this right right so in general the once you have decided whether you're going to be even or rounding down okay it doesn't really matter which number you pick the five the seven the nine it's not that big of a deal the way to determine whether you want to be the kind of flat zero type pricing right. or that you would be going uh, down is first, you know, think about the industry or, or that you are in. So if you are a gift or a luxury item, people are more likely to want to pay full price. And so it would be, you know, for one, like a you know, Louis Vuitton doesn't necessarily want to be associated with being a discount or a bargain, right? Okay. So does it make sense to round down? Similarly, most people aren't going and really excited about buying discount wine. Yeah. So they're like, I'm rather pay, two buck chuck. Right. People feel better about buying a $42 bottle of wine than a $39 bottle of wine. Um, because it, it just has, it doesn't feel like it's this budget discounted pricing, right? Especially if you're buying to give it to somebody right. else. And even when you look at something like a camera, when it was marketed as being something that you were taking on this trip and you were going to use for yourself, for remembering this amazing experience, people wanted to pay more than when it was referenced as something you needed for work or for school, more of a functional item that they wanted to pay less for the exact same camera based on how it was presented to them of what the use was going to be. So with okay. your service... If you want to round down, trying to be in the discounted or budget type of pricing, of which a lot of people feel inclined to do, and that's okay, then you can pick whether you like 975s, you know, doesn't really make it. Oh, it doesn't? Difference. Okay. But once you get to the, like, the ones, the twos, the threes, then it feels like you're rounding up. And so that's right, you're pushing it over the price, right? Then it feels like you're nickel and diming people that doesn't right. feel very good. Right. Um, so it's better to either be even or work your way down. So I had a client once who, because of their fixed costs, they couldn't go to like a 99. Uh, it had to be something it was, I think it was priced at one twelve, and that was, they, they couldn't come down, you know, in different ways right. to which it's better to be at even 115, 120, 125, 119. Perception, right? It's like how, how you perceive it. Exactly. Yeah. And so that shift makes a difference. And just really for your own sanity, as well as people, when they're looking at things, don't have it like this one ends in a nine and that ends in a seven. And this is a five. Be consistent. Yeah. Pick one, go with it. It will make it easier on everybody. And uh, last tip on this being, if you don't want the number to look as big, whether you're rounded right. or not, don't include any of the punctuation. So when you have something with change, like let's say it's 1200, comma, don't put a comma. Right. And don't put one comma two zero zero period zero zero. It feels much bigger than just one, two, zero, zero. And anytime where you can remove the dollar sign, it actually helps it to feel less painful for people uh, to buy as well. And there's a chapter of, uh, on pain of paying in the book. All right, well, it's good to know. So coincidentally, because in my website, so I have, you know, for a basic young couple, they have one baby that you just started a business with a partner, you need a basic business agreement. I don't know why I did this, but I guess somebody gave me advice. And those prices are like $9.99, you know, those type, type of things, because they're supposed to be discounted. But the other ones, I don't, I mean, I can't like deal with, like if it's $2,500 for your package or whatever, I, I'm not going to charge you $24.99, you know, it's a silly number. Right. And you don't, um, so you can have something where if you know for that specific client type, because, you know, new baby, lots of expenses, right. the things you're dealing with that budget conscious can play in, in a way that is different for, um, you know, someone who's, uh, planning for their 
retirement in a way that they are wanting to make sure they're getting a good value. Yes, but they're investing in their future in a way they've been saving. And perhaps the mind state that comes around being 999 is different than a thousand. It's just a thousand dollars for this, you know, feels perhaps a little bit different. So yeah, uh, it's okay in that way to have some difference. But if you're kind of stacking, say packages and say, this one is Twenty four ninety nine, and this is fifteen hundred, and this is seven fifty seven. Like, what? What? <laughs> <laughs> makes no sense. Right. Seven fifty seven and ninety two cents, or something weird. <laughs> yeah. No, just... I think people want to. They want to put like logic to your pricing mechanisms. Like, where the hell is he coming up with this? Right. <laughs> right. And it probably shakes their confidence in you. Exactly. That like, did you even think about this? And again, that kind of nickel and diming vibe that comes off of it being so exacting in that way is like, I couldn't possibly take anything on. And so it doesn't feel like you're going and scraping to the very lowest you can charge them. It feels more like you're going the other way, regardless of what you're even if you are. Yeah, Yeah. right. Exactly. Okay. So if I'm a business owner then, and I can test different things is like, what's the best way to figure out what, what my clientele is looking for, what you know, what, why they do business like with me, you know, what drives them is, is, do I do surveys? Do I like, what's the methodology for that? Um, so you can, in a case of, of asking people why they do something or what they would do. You are asking their conscious brain a question of what the subconscious is doing. They don't speak the same language. Um, There have actually been studies that show when you put someone into, it's called an fMRI machine and you have them watch an ad and you can see what areas of their brain are lighting up. And then you ask them, you know, how they felt about it. You can essentially like watch the brain lie to itself as it's trying to explain what it liked or, or didn't like. Cause it just doesn't. So you're know. saying like your customers won't really know. Right. What their the, real motivation yeah, the is. The and can't tell you of the book, <laughs> a title is because they don't know why Got they it. actually buy. Right. What this really brand drives them things. emotionally. Yeah. Right. Yes. And yeah. so there are, it's not to say that you should never do surveys and that qualitative and quantitative research is a waste of time or anything like that. However, if you're not trained in it and specifically with this insight into what's happening in the brain and how you might be uh, biasing a response or all of that, it's potentially not going to be as valuable for you. And how many of you, before you launched your business, went out and asked all your friends and family members if they thought it was a good idea and they would buy from you and they all said, yeah, that sounds great. And then they didn't buy from you. It was very frustrating. Yeah. For the most part, they weren't intentionally lying to you. <laughs> I don't know, hundred percent. They believe their own BS. <laughs> but they, you know, it's like, yeah, that sounds great. I would totally right. want that. But they don't know what's motivating their behavior. So, right. there's a lot instead, of issues though with that. A lot of like, right. you know, they don't want to be disappointed. They don't want to tell you the truth. Who knows? All kinds of stuff. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So when you look at your uh, clients, uh, that your potential clients who you're looking to sell to, to be able to first address. And the biggest mistake that people make is not really understanding the problem that they are trying to solve. You know, what's the behavior, what's keeping people from doing this thing right now? Right. And how can you then identify those behaviors and then, you know, really put all the eggs you possibly can into whatever basket to keep them moving down the path. Uh, Episode two of my podcast. Mm -hmm. Uh, So way it's actually from the day we're recording, which, you know, I'm sure this, you know, today's the 4th of July weekend. This will be out in maybe 90 days or something, maybe a little bit less. Yeah. Well, so my podcast launched um, on July 6th, three years ago. So we're right on the verge of that. And the name of the podcast is brainy, the brainy brainy business, brainy business. Okay. The brainy business. Yes. Which is my company as well. So try to make that as easy. So if they, but if they go to Apple and they search brainy business, they're going to come up with, and if, and if the host is Melina, definitely you. Yes. (laughs) Yes. Uh, Or even if you search behavioral economics, it should come up. Okay. Um, But uh, this, that second episode, which is one that was, you know, high 
request and whatnot was the top five wording mistakes businesses make. And it's oh, still, uh, you know, second most downloaded episode of the podcast. It's very much looking at how you can make a few simple tweaks using some of these concepts, you know, that I've already been talking about today and some additional ones uh, yeah. to start, you know, streamlining what you're putting out there, looking at different ways to present the information and just understanding, like I've already said, what people are actually trying to accomplish and how you are the solution for them when you get out of talking about your features, you know, and being really interesting. I, one of my favorite examples is a company called the Literary. The Literary? Which if you were to, the Literary, yes. Okay. And I'll tell you why that's their name as we okay. get into what they do. <laughs> uh, but if we, I was to say, you know, effective immediately, your new job is that you have to ensure everyone properly throws away and sorts their garbage every single time and you can't do anything else professionally until you fix this problem around the world. Probably thinking like you're doomed, right? Doomed. <laughs> Never you told me I had to do in the neighborhood, I'd be doomed. The world? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Whoa, that's never going to happen. No. Uh, I'm doomed to this life for the rest of my life. Uh, and so this is a something that you'd be stuck with. And, but the first thing you would still probably think to do if you, as you start digging in and you understand the problem, you think, man, people just don't know if they understood X, Y, or Z, they would totally be motivated. They must not know which is compost and which is recycling. And we need another brochure and a video educating them. And one more, you know, turtle with a straw in its nose or whatever it is to <laughs> push them over the edge. Right. But that logical approach clearly doesn't really work and motivate behavior. Our conscious brain would like to think that it will, but right. it doesn't. What the literary has done is incorporated this understanding of the brain and what motivates it. And they turn litter into lottery tickets. So when you properly sort and throw away your garbage, you'll get an instant ping on your phone that says, great job, Melina, you recycled that bottle. You've been entered into the lottery. Good luck. And if you throw it in the wrong place or like try to throw away a rock or a leaf or something, it will tell you that doesn't count. Um, you know, if it was the bottle and you put it in the compost, it would say, you know, this actually doesn't go here next time it goes in recycling and then you'll be entered to win that time. They tested in movie theaters, which is, one of the grossest spots ever. <laughs> if you remember going to the movies, yeah, everybody leaves their just, stuff and they leave for the person to pick it up. That's the right. way they do. That's things. how it has always been done. Always been done. Yeah. Yeah. So they tested across four movie theaters in Sweden for 30 days and had 100% compliance of every single person properly throwing away and sorting every single piece of trash they had. They even had people running through the aisles trying to see if anybody left something behind after the movie so they could throw that away. Women were like rifling through their purses to fly, find Kleenex or anything else they could be throwing away to get additional entries. And that was just to win 5,000 euro, which is a lot, especially for throwing away a gum wrapper, yeah. whatever that is. But as they're partnering with large municipalities or, you know, statewide lotteries, and you could win a million dollars yeah. if you throw away that bottle. Now, instead, when you're walking down the street and you see it, instead of going, Ugh, some people are so gross and just continuing on your way. Right. Exactly. You go, Ooh, that, I could win. A piece something. of garbage. Yeah. It's worth something it now. Right. So they don't have to be doing it for the, what you would deem as the right reason but having that motivator, we love a lottery. We love the idea that we might win something. We have optimism bias and loss aversion and yeah. all these things that are working. It's getting them to do the right thing. And it helps reduce just so many, you know, other uh, problems for expenses for the, the government and, and whatnot to just help everything really work well together. So looking at something like that, when you can motivate for the action you want. In that case, we just want people to throw stuff away. They don't have to know, you know, the exact square footage. Yeah, who cares of garbage what's, island. what's right? Doesn't right. matter. Right. Doesn't matter why. 
Yeah. You need that motivator. So looking at things from that slightly different perspective, it's really easy to find the right answer to the wrong question. So make sure you're trying to solve the right problem before you get started. An interesting comment. Um, you know, they're doing that with vaccines in some of the states. Yes. My friends yes. from West Virginia, they had like a 30% vaccination rate. So they came out and they said, listen, if you get a vaccine, you're going to go in a lottery. You get to choose whether you get like a gun, a vacation, a million dollars. It was like a whole series of stuff. Right. And the, and a lot, and the rate went up a lot. Right. Yes. Uh, it's definitely been something in the behavioral science community people have been talking about. And, uh, so in Pennsylvania, they worked with behavioral economists, uh, from there of developing the, the setup that they did, um, for that encouraging an action again, telling people about how bad it is if they don't do something. No, it generally and, doesn't motivate people a little right. bit, not much. Yep. Well, and anybody really that is on the fence is in this, I, know, I talked about nudging. So that's yeah. nudgeable, like trying to decide if they should or not. And maybe there's a social stigma amongst their friends or family members to where they feel like they may be an outsider if they were to go against, we're a herding species. So if they were going to go against the herd to go get the vaccine and be somewhat shunned, right? they can say, well, I was just in it for the million bucks right. or whatever it is and figure, meh, like, why not? And then you have kind of an out permission, right? Yeah. Um, there was something that, um, what was I just going to ask you? I remember I lost my train of thought, but it, it, it's, it's, um, I find that a lot of this stuff is like, it overlaps with, um, I just read a book on it, that Japanese concept called, um, Kaizen, where mm -hmm. you little changes, like little things affect people in a big way, like they, they use the example in the subway. I don't know how many times you've been to New York, but New York subways used to be like, I mean, littered with graffiti inside, yeah. outside. Mm -hmm. And when the new um, there, I think under Giuliani, but when whoever was head of the Port Authority at the time or head of the Metro system, whatever, they started just um, cleaning the cars like they wouldn't let any graffiti sit. It was always clean and people stopped doing it because they were like, they didn't want to be the first one to mess up the car. And right. then they started giving t tickets to people that were like jumping the turnstiles. And they're like, why are you doing that? You got to like chase people that are like mugging people. Crime went down so much because the people that want to mug somebody, they don't want to be bothered with getting a ticket, jumping a turnstile. Like, right. and, and they stopped doing it. Right. And it, it was crazy. And it's kind of that same, right? Like yeah. little changes make a big difference when you're doing the right kind of changes that motivate, you know, behavior. But I think a lot of business owners, they don't take the time. And maybe that's where the title of my podcast comes from, but they don't take the time. Like the information's there. You're there. There's people right. there that they can learn about and do and learn these little things to just look, is it going to improve their business hundred percent? No, but what was the statistic used before? 38%. That's a lot. Right. 10% yeah. well, a lot, you know. Yeah. Being that we we heard. So one good tip as I, I think we're probably closing out here, but you look at um, because we like to do what other people like us have done, especially when we are uncertain, yeah. it may seem unnecessary to take something like your most popular item and say it's most popular or a best value. Someone can calculate that. I don't need to tell them. It seems unnecessary. Uh, but looking at restaurants in China, the w many years ago being some of the first to do this most popular on an item, right? Just by labeling things that truly were the most popular as most popular, their sales went up thirteen to twenty percent depending on the item. And so, if you were to say your most popular was going to be twenty percent more popular just by saying it's the most popular, seems ridiculous and it really works. <laughs> yeah. Well, doesn't yeah. it draw your eye to that? Like you're looking around, you're like, Oh, most popular. I'll take that one. Right. It draws your eye to it. And when you're uncertain, you're going to a restaurant for the first time. So for people that had eaten there a lot, I don't Didn't care. Matter. I know what I like. Right. You know, I don't need that, but it's my first time. I'm not really sure what I should get. This is also why star ratings and testimonials and reviews, all that social proof is important because of how we heard. And so calling attention to it and saying, yeah, it's the most popular best value. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And then you go, huh. Or, you know, number one choice or whatever that is to say, everybody else likes this. That's at least where you want to start. 
And because our brains get what they expect, then we're expecting it's going to be better. We're probably going to end up actually liking it more, assuming it's not terrible. terrible. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) No, but don't we, I think subconsciously we don't like, like if we make a bad decision, right? We want to have something to fall back on and say, well, you know, it was the most popular. So I did that even though, you know, whatever. And, right. and not like blame yourself for making some stupid, well, like we don't like to make stupid decisions, even though they might not be that stupid. Yeah. Being able to know that we did something because everybody else did again, it's that sort of fallback option to say like, well, you know, they said it was the most popular. That's not about me. I didn't make a bad choice. They're just terrible. <laughs> you you right. have an option that you can kind of uh, get an out if you need it. So you don't have to feel like you made a bad choice. Yeah. People definitely like permission subconsciously. <laughs> I think the pandemic did that for a lot of people. Yeah. They didn't like their job, but they would never quit and then have to say, oh, it didn't work. But if they got laid off, their company went out of business. Now they got all the permission in the world. Right. Yeah. And to get out of that, well, just, you know, looping back around to how the brain works and knowing that our decisions are made by a subconscious using rules of thumb that have worked in the past. So anything that's being decided about what to do in the next moment or down the line is based on something that has worked before, which is why we're so ingrained in the status quo and predictability and knowing what's going to happen. This is where you get those graduation goggles say, you know, or you applied for the other job, or you were thinking about leaving the company you've been at for a long time to go on to this entrepreneurial passion that you've had for a long time. And then Right when you're about, you get offered the new job or you have that first client and you have that moment where you go, "Mm, well, but like maybe like this could go wrong or what about that or blah, blah, blah. And you feel this like sick in your stomach and maybe you're up at night and it's just agonizing, which makes you think it's the wrong choice. It isn't necessarily the wrong choice. just now that you're faced with that moment and your brain is thinking about all of this predictability that it loves and is going to lose, it's putting some flags ahead of you to keep that safety net that it enjoys. So as long as you did the due diligence when you were in more of a cold state and it wasn't do or die moment and you know, it's the right choice, taking that time to jump, uh, it can be, it can feel a little bit scary, but it doesn't mean that it's bad. Right. It's like what Gleb talks about. If you have a process for making decisions, yeah. you'll improve your chances of success. But I think you're right. Subconsciously, we like what we know mm-hmm. and we shy away from what we don't really know, even though we're evaluating, we're not there. We don't have the job yet. We uh, could be a bad boss, all this type of stuff. Like, it's like if we were on like a desert Island, yeah. like paradise, right. And we're living there and it's nice. Somebody comes along and says, Hey, I have another Island and it's less expensive and it's down the road. It's beautiful. You're like, yeah, but so what if they told you, listen, we just discovered that there's a volcano underneath your island and it's going to blow, could be tomorrow, could be a month from now. You don't care so much about what the other island's like. You just want to get the hell off. Maybe. So we... <laughs> or you might be thinking like, well, it's been there all this time. Yeah. I mean, it's not really going to happen. Yeah, that's right. true. Well, let's assume when he brings some charts and graphs. On, I'll have the contingency plan. So my boat's yeah. ready. When <laughs> right, Exactly. We put the boat over there. And let's take off real quick. Yeah, I'll be fine. I know, but it's we are our worst enemies when it comes to we sabotage ourselves all the time. We definitely do, and it's because we like that safety, and it's just the way that we are wired. So that's okay. And like I said, this is why the last part four of my book Mm -hmm. is eight pages long. I think it's barely. It's just a little bit, but to say don't get stuck is the, right. the actual title of part four. And it's all these little biases that our brains are going to be putting up to make us feel like we're not quite ready to take yeah. the step. And that's where you don't implement the stuff you learned at the conference or on the podcast, or you were so excited. And then Monday morning comes and you just fall get back, back into your old ways. routine. Yeah. And so learning a little bit about that. So you can say, no, this is you know, one of them is bike shedding. I know we don't have time to get into it, but like, is this my bike shed? Probably I'm going to move forward and you can have a, a little shift in your yeah. ability to just step forward. Yeah. Well, that's why I'm always pushing people to do things in writing, to, you know, write a business plan, to have a strategic plan, to put their ideas down to mm-hmm. whatever. Cause then they can go back to that. If they're, if they're not comfortable, they're like, oh, am I making the right decision? They can go back to 
your notes or whatever they did that they wrote down. This was going to be part of what they're doing. And they mm-hmm. can say, oh, yeah, that's right. I, you know, I forgot I was going to do that. But they don't all right. the time. They don't. They call me to fix the problem when their business is falling apart. And I got to negotiate them out of whatever it is they signed on, you know, yeah. bank loans yep. and leases and all that kind of stuff. It's a mess. Yep. If something is important, anything you can do right now to do just the little bit of something to help your brain to realize this matters to me is going to help you overcome another concept. It's called time discounting, where we think about ourselves in the future differently than today. So it's easy to commit yourself to go run tomorrow and set that alarm at 5 a.m. When it goes off and you go, ooh, me? And you come up with all (laughs) kinds of reasons. You know, I didn't sleep well last night. The dog was barking and, you know, I'll do it next time. And then, you, yeah. Which is still future you. It's easy to commit future you, but if you make it something real in this moment right now, even something small can help the you of today know that this will matter even tomorrow. Yeah. Well, Melina, I can't thank you enough for coming on. We will put a link in the show notes to your book and to the podcast. And I get you send them all to me. So I get all your social media links and everything like that. We'll put that out there. I hope that you have a very, because it is July 4th. Today's July 2nd, right? So I hope you have a very happy 4th of July. Thanks. And I appreciate you spending time with me. Yeah, thanks for having me.